having attended the first string meeting in 2001, I welcome all of you and wish all of you a um, gratifying, interesting, and exciting meeting as in 2001, and even better. So it is an honor for me to introduce Nima Arkani Ahmed from the Institute for Advanced Study, who will uh, give a review talk on the LHC and Fuchsia Colliders. Oh, uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, good night, uh, whatever the case may be uh, for your body clock. Um, it's all of the above for me right now. So, uh, um, and um, it's absolutely wonderful to be here in uh, uh, Bangalore again. Um, so the, the organizers um, asked me to uh, talk about um, the uh, physics prospects of the LHC, which is of course just turned back on now. And um, uh, uh, as, as, as we'll review in this talk, this is probably the most exciting two to three year period of the uh, entire running of the, uh, of the LHC. Also perhaps say something about um, uh, prospects for what might come uh, beyond the LHC. <clears throat> so, um, so let's start with some uh, super basics. Uh, so the LHC, uh, so of course you all know all of these things. This is officially for the students, you know, so. Um, <laughs> So, um, but the, uh, so the LHC is a proton-proton collider. It started its uh, center mass energy of 7 TeV and went, went to 8 TeV. And the upcoming run now um, is at 13 TeV. Maybe it'll go to 13 and a half, uh, 14 TeV uh, eventually. Um, <clears throat> the luminosity is around uh, 10 to the 34 per centimeter squared per second. And the way to convert that into uh, an actual number of events for any process is you take the luminosity, you multiply by the cross section. So that, that gives you uh, an event rate. Now, units, um, we're colliding protons at the LHC. The uh, proton is a mass of, of around 1 GeV, a size of around 1 GeV inverse, which is 10 to the minus 14 centimeters. The TeV scale is around 10 to the minus uh, 17 centimeters. Um, uh, perhaps I should say that I'm, I'm going through some of this because a long time ago, I remember a, a relatively eminent mathematical physicist uh, um, was very excited about the possibility that the string scale might be at a TeV. And he said, TeV, that's amazing. That, that, that's a millimeter, right? <laughs> so, uh, so <clears throat> anyway, it wasn't a string theorist, don't worry. That, uh, um, but um, uh, now, the, the, the typical units in particle physics is this historically named barn, which is around 10 to the minus 24 centimeters squared. And the rough size of the proton, the, the, the total cross-section when you collide two protons together is around the size of the proton squared is around 10 to the minus 28, minus 27, 10 to the minus 28 centimeters squared, and that's around a millibar. Okay, so that's, the, that's the, just the size, the raw size of colliding two protons together gives you a cross-section of about a millibar. Now, the typical cross-section when you're colliding particles with a center of mass energy around a TeV with the strong interactions, the typical cross-section is around alpha strong squared over a TeV squared, and that's around 10 to the minus 36 centimeters squared. So that's the sort of going rate for interesting hard processes from the strong interactions at the LHC. Um, that's about a picobar. Okay, so, so those are the numbers that you're going to hear for cross sections from the LHC. Picobar of um, femtobar, which is one one thousandth of a picobar. So here, so here we start from the millibar, which is the total cross section, microbar, nanobar. I hate SI units. I can never remember what they are, but anyway, here's picobar. And front to barn, which is 10 to the minus 36 to 10 to the minus 39 uh, centimeters squared. Those are the typical LHC cross sections. And here are the kinds of event rates that we're talking about with the, uh, with the luminosity. So the total number of events is around a billion events per second. Uh, TT bar is maybe around 10, 10 TT bar per second. So back in 1994, 14 top quarks were produced, and that was enough to qualify for a discovery. And today, we're, we're making 10 of them uh, every second at the LHC. Uh, the cross-section for producing single Ws, uh, or two Ws, or two Zs, um, is, is around uh, you know, 100,000 picobarn, or 100 picobarn, 1,000 events second, one event per second. And if we're lucky, and there's supersymmetry at the TeV scale, these cross-sections are around a picobarn. And so that's a nice human time scale, one event a minute, if we're damn lucky, right? One event a minute. And that's why that's these cross-sections, that these luminosities were designed so that these, uh, these events would happen at a reasonable enough rate that we care about them, we make enough events and learn what's going on. Okay, now here's a cartoon for typical uh, supersymmetric cross-sections at, at the LHC. 
And you'll notice something a little interesting about them. So they, 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 they span about a factor of a million. Okay? So that's maybe slightly surprising. Uh, we'll talk about why that is in a second. But there's a huge range of cross-sections that experimentalists have got to look for um, uh, from now. These are already ruled out. You know, colored particles at around 100 GeV would give you a cross-section of around 1,000 picobarn. Um, and so, but you see, as we go from 100 GeV to a TeV, the cross-sections drop by a lot. They drop by five or six orders of magnitude. And the electroweak cross-sections are around 1,000 times smaller than the strong cross-sections. Okay? So there's this huge range of cross-sections that the experimentalists have to look for. <laughs> and you can't see any of the, uh, yeah, this is a useless slide. Uh, but uh, this is just showing you in more detail. Gluino pairs, squark pairs, gluino squark, and so on. All these plots always look the same. You have these steeply falling uh, cross sections as a function of the mass of the particle that you're producing. So where does this qualitative fact come from? Uh, if you're doing collisions at an E plus E minus collider, this would not be the case, right? If you're doing collisions at an E plus E minus collider, the cross section just goes like one over S, okay? So there, there, are some, there are some amplitudes squared in the total cross section. So we have two to two scattering. The amplitude is dimensionless, so the cross section goes like uh, the amplitude squared over S. Um, and that is indeed the underlying partonic cross section, of course, is going like the amplitude squared over S. But there's a very important uh, fact about hadronic collisions that, that you all know, that we have the actual partons inside the protons that are, uh, that are colliding with each other. And we don't have a picture of, of the protons as consisting of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of just up quarks and down quarks. They fragment into gluons that keep splitting into quarks and antiquarks and gluons and so on. And so this cross section, uh, this two to two cross section is convoluted with what, what you can call a parton luminosity, which tells you uh, how likely it is to find a partons carrying that fraction of the, uh, that center of mass uh, energy, right? So the total center of mass energy is 13 TeV, but there is something that tells you uh, what, uh, how likely it is to find the underlying partons carrying that uh, center of mass energy S. And the important point is, just a fact of life about QCD, that these partonic luminosities fall very rapidly with energy. Okay? Because these partonic luminosities, so, I mean, that, that's what the plots actually look like. Depending on, on where you are, it depends on whether it's whether it's glue glue or QQ or QQ bar and so on. So these are what the actual partonic luminosities look like. This plot actually explains a lot of the qualitative facts that I was, uh, uh, that I was telling you uh, earlier. I won't have time to explain all of them. But roughly speaking, you see that it sort of falls off as, as a power. And it's roughly 1 over energy to the fourth, 1 over energy to the fifth. It's pretty high power. It dies off as a pretty high power of energy. <clears throat> that has a number of consequences. Um, if you're at, let's say, you had an E plus E minus collider, and you're at an energy of 10 TeV. If you collide to E plus E minus and TT bar come out, the TT bar coming out screaming out with 5 TeV each. Right? So they, they, have, they have huge velocity. But uh, at a hadron collider, that's not true. Because these proton luminosities fall so rapidly, uh, you always produce massive particles roughly at rest. Okay? Um, in fact, typically, the typical velocity, the, the typical beta squared is around 1 over root 2. Okay, so they're, they're, they're somewhat relativistic, but they're not super relativistic. And this means that the actual cross-section is this thing that we expect on general dimensional grounds. But at, so now at a, at a fixed mass, the actual cross-section is what we expect on general dimensional grounds. But there's a dependence on the center of mass energy that goes roughly like E center of mass over the, over the mass of the particle to roughly about a, a power of 4. That's why it's such a big deal. You know, when you think we go from 8 TeV to 13 TeV, why is it such a big deal? It doesn't, doesn't sound like such, such a big deal. Even when you go from the Tevatron to the LHC, why is 2 TeV to 7 TeV such a big deal, 13 TeV such a big deal? It's because of these large powers. Uh, the actual rates can get bigger by about a factor of 50 uh, if you just go up in center of mass energy by about a factor of 2. And so, um, this tells us why, in the upcoming run of the LHC, I, maybe I forgot to say this earlier, but we're talking about the, the total luminosity that this next upcoming run of the LHC is going to gather, probably by the end of 2017, is around 100 inverse femtobarn. Uh, by 2020, it'll probably triple that to 300 inverse femtobarn. And asymptotically, if we go to the high luminosity version of the LHC, maybe we're talking about 3,000 inverse femtobarn. Okay? Um, but with these numbers, you can see why run two is so much a bigger deal than run one, because 
the, the, the rough reach for producing particles of the same mass is up by a factor of 13 over 8 to the fourth. And we collect a little bit more data compared to run 1. So roughly speaking, it's 100 times more powerful in reach than run 1. Okay? All right. So very broad lessons. Um, the reach for colored particles is around 1 to 3 TeV. Um, uncolored particles, much smaller, around 200 to 400 GeV. Just, just so the rate for producing them is large enough that you have a, a reasonable, uh, that you have a reasonable event rate. Secondly, the fact that the cross section has the scaling with e center of mass uh, to the fourth over m to the sixth means that you get a far bigger bang for your buck uh, by increasing the energy than by simply gathering more data. Okay, so that's why every time at a hadron collider you go up by factor of energy. The first year or two of running is the most exciting time. But that's where you get the biggest uh, increase in reach. And after that, it's, after that, it's just root n, if you're lucky. Right? Uh, you might be systematics limited, in which case it's not even that. Okay? But here, this is, where you get the, uh, this is where you get the biggest bang for your buck early. And so that's why this period that we're in now will be by far the most exciting period of the LHC uh, for discovering new particles. And so in order to illustrate that, uh, we did a little exercise. Uh, this is with um, uh, one of our wonderful postdocs at the Institute, Rafael Tito Daniolo, um, just to illustrate uh, this point and give you a rough idea for what we might be expecting in the next, uh, uh, in the, by the end of the summer, by the end of the year, and by the end of the run. Uh, we're just going to go through various, uh, uh, various possibilities for new particles and illustrate what we might know on all these uh, different timescales. So let's start by talking about um, uh, gluino pair pair production. So, so here the process is just uh, uh, QCD production of, of uh, gluinos. Um, so, and, and what we're starting with here is what the limits are right now. Okay? The limits from run one. Um, these are two sigma exclusion limits. And um, depending on uh, how the gluino decays. So here's a, here's a relatively spectacular way that it could decay. It could decay through an on or off shell stop into TT bar plus the, uh, plus the lightest neutralino. So you would get four tops plus a missing energy in the final state. And that's something where right now the bounds from the LHC are around 1.4 TeV. Okay? So, uh, so in all cases, what we're doing, one of the strongest bounds and also uh, one of the uh, weaker bounds. So here's a case where the current bounds are around 1 TeV, a little smaller. Um, where, uh, where it's gluino pair production, but it's decaying. There's R parity violation. So it's just decaying all to quarks, just jets, very missy, no missing energy. So the limits are weaker. Not that much weaker. It's around a TeV. All right. So, so now here's the exercise. Imagine that the gluino is really at, right, at the, right at the limit from uh, run one. Um, and what we're showing here is what the two sigma exclusion contours are going to be as a function of the amount of luminosity that you gather. And here is, roughly speaking, the timeline that would correspond to that amount of uh, integrated luminosity. So by the end of the summer, we'll have maybe you know, a few, uh, uh, two inverse femtobarn, few inverse femtobarn. By December, by the end of the year, uh, we'll have around, between the uh, two experiments, 5 plus 5, around 10 inverse uh, femtobarn. Uh, by the 2017, we have around 100 inverse femtobarn. And so you can see that if the gluino is right here, if the gluino is right at its current exclusion limit, um, now we're making a guess here as to what discovery, what you need to claim discovery. Th this is a, th you should not take this plot very seriously because it's using a rough rule of thumb. Things are very dependent on the specific analysis and so on. This is using a rough rule of thumb that no experimentalist that I talked to has ever disagreed with, <laughs> that the number of events you need in order to claim a discovery is roughly 10 times as much as you need to set a two sigma exclusion. So a five sigma discovery needs five, roughly 10 times as many events as a two sigma exclusion. So this shows you that if the gluino is at 1.4 TeV, heck, if it's at 1.5 TeV, then by the, end of the, by, by, by the end of the year, we could have a five sigma discovery. Okay? So that illustrates the big, what I said, right? You turn on the machine and you immediately get a big bang for your buck. On the other hand, of course, this is also the, the, the exclusion goes up. So by, so by, by already by, uh, by, by the end of the summer, we'll, we'll be going from 
1.4 to 1.5 TeV. By December, we'll be at around 1.7 TeV for two sigma exclusion. Okay? Now, on the other hand, these plots also illustrate the flip side of this, which is, let's say we haven't seen anything. Let's say we haven't seen anything. We're setting two sigma exclusions by the end of this year. Okay? So if the gluino there, you can ask, when will you see a five sigma discovery potentially? Well, for that, you've got to go all the way to 2017 in order to see a five sigma discovery. So that's still possible. Excitement is still possible. Even if there's exclusions at the end of this year, it's still possible to have five sigma discoveries by the, uh, by the end of this run. Now let's say by the end of this run, you're setting two sigma exclusions. Okay, and now you see where the trouble begins, right? So by the end of this run, we're setting two sigma exclusions. Then we are really going to have to start going out into the humongous amount of luminosity in order to be able to see five sigma discovery. Okay, so that's just illustrating the extremely simple point, um, uh, but a little, more, uh, a little more concretely. And so here's what it is. All the pictures are going to look like this. Here's what it is in the case of... Uh, uh, in the more difficult case where the limit is already is, uh, is less than about a TeV, but again, by the, by the end of the year, the limit will be at one TeV could be discovered. Uh, anyway, it's, it's exactly, basically the same story. All right, so we'll go through the rest of them. A, uh, we can go through the rest of them a little bit more uh, rapidly. So, so here's a story for stops, and here again, it's direct stop production. So stops are important because they're the most important uh, particle in supersymmetry for making the theory as natural as possible because the largest uh, quadratic ultraviolet sensitivity of the Higgs mass comes from a loop of the top quark. And once again, it's the same story. So right now, if you have a very vanilla a kind of uh, model where, uh, where, where you're producing tops that stops at the k to top plus a much lighter uh, neutralino, then already the limits are around 700 GeV. Um, uh, once again, if it's decaying in a messy way through our parity violation or s some other hadronic way without much missing energy, the limits are pretty crappy right now. Okay? Um, in fact, the stop today could be at 200 GeV, and we, 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 we might not know it if it decays in a sufficiently complicated way. Okay? But again, it's not going to hide <laughs> forever. Okay? So once again, if the stop is right at the current limit, we can have a five sigma discovery by the end of this year, and, um, and it's basically, basically the same story. Now, um, uh, here's a uh, uh, slightly different story. Uh, so uh, we might imagine that, in fact, uh, all the squarks are roughly degenerate. That was a picture that, that was very attractive uh, a long time ago. Um, and uh, the only reason why people talk about it a little less now is, uh, is that there are strong limits for the production of gluinos and the first two generation squarks, um, which already push you above a TeV. So if the stops are degenerated with the light sparks, then that would already be pushing you into somewhat fine-tuned territory as far as the stop is concerned. But still, maybe things are just a little bit fine-tuned, 10%, 1%, a little bit fine-tuned. So let's say all the stops are roughly degenerate. Then once again, here are the current limits for everybody. So here it's in the case where really the gluinos and the sparks, everyone is uh, uh, degenerate. Current limits around 1.5 TeV. Once again, exactly the same story, but asymptotically we can get to around two and a half, maybe three TeV. So this is the other obvious thing that you've seen in all these plots. We are not, we're increasing our reach on the particles by about a factor of, about a, about a factor of two, okay, a little more than two. Okay. okay, so that was for the strongly interacting particles. And now this, this illustrates uh, uh, all the qualitative facts. Now for the weakly interacting particles, let's say we have, uh, we're directly producing Higgsinos. Uh, so all the scales here are a lot lower. Now we're talking about hundreds of uh, GeV rather than uh, uh, two, three TeV. Uh, and here again, these are the relatively easy cases where you produce hexenos, charginos. They, they decay to w, Ws and neutralinos or Wz and uh, neutralinos. And again, so, so you see what the, what the, uh, what the reach is, uh, is going to be in these two cases. A very similar story for the Winos. Again, you produce the Winos and they decay to the lightest neutralino plus a uh, plus missing energy with Ws and Zs. <coughs> now, here's a, a more uh, striking example of how there are some, some questions for which the LHC is just not that great. <laughs> okay? um, and uh, so this is a, a, a plot made by Lian Tao Wang, who's been studying these things. We'll see similar plots when we talk about 100 TeV colliders later. 
Um, but uh, so here's uh, what the reach is for directly producing dark matter. So let's say that there's, there's WIMPs, okay? Um, but we have the simplest possible picture for what WIMPs could be, which is that they're just electroweak charged states, electroweak doublets, electroweak triplets. Okay? Uh, if, you, if you ask uh, in, in that simplest possible model, where all the interactions are just governed by the weak interactions in the standard model, the masses that these particles would have to have in order for them to be dark matter are 1 TeV if they're doublets, if they're, if they're thermal relic. It's 1 TeV if they're doublets, uh, 2.7 TeV. I forget exactly what it is, something around that. 3 TeV if they're uh, electric triplets. So that's the reasonable mass that a WIMPs can have. Okay? In the simplest possible model for what WIMPs could be, the mass is not a few hundred GeV. The mass is 1 TeV or 2 TeV or 3 TeV. Okay? Um, and so you can ask, can the LHC directly produce uh, dark matter particles? Well, ignoring the constraint from the thermal relic, we can just ask, can you directly produce, directly pair produce Xenos? Let's call the doublets Xenos and the triplets Xenos. Can you directly produce these uh, dark matter particles? Of course, you can't collide proton proton and just look for nothing coming out. Um, so what you have to do is, is, uh, is pay a price to radiate a jet from the initial state. Um, and so you look for these monojet events. And here's what the reach looks like. Okay, so uh, at, uh, at uh, 14 TeV, you see five sigma discovery um, reaches not even up to 200 GeV, and that's for the good case of Winos, um, and even less than that uh, for the case of Hexenos. You see, we're b for Hexenos, we're barely beating the direct limit bound from LEP. Okay. LEP directly looked for, uh, could directly look, look for these guys. So, and that's because it's weak process, and you have to pay the extra price to irradiate an uh, extra jet. Okay? Now, when beforehand we saw higher masses for Hexenos and Winos, it's because um, you didn't have to pay that extra price. You produce some heavier state and it decayed to lighter states with missing energy. So, so you had uh, more handles on, on the event. But this is a good model for, you're looking for very simple, direct production of dark matter. And the LHC is going to get us into this uh, pretty low mass window for what it might be. And not anywhere near, uh, about a factor of five, six off, uh, or more off from the natural mass if they're actually um, thermal relic. So we'll, we'll come back, we'll, again, we'll come back to that when we talk about uh, <coughs> possible 100 TV colliders. All right, and finally, um, just a non-supersymmetric example, we could do this all day, but, um, uh, but just, just so you see an example of much higher masses, uh, this is the reach for producing Z primes. Okay? So just, just, to, uh, just to normalize, these are Z primes with couplings, basically standard model strength, uh, because their resonances, the reach goes up much, much higher. So we could, of course, go up to five 6 TV, um, ultimately, but it's always the same story um, with uh, uh, limits versus uh, ex exclusion limits versus uh, discovery. Okay, so I hope that gives you some idea of uh, of, of what what we might learn uh, when, as far as uh, 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 discovering new particles. And again, you should take this with a grain of salt because this is taking an extremely coarse definition. <laughs> of what discovery is, saying that it's 10 times as many events as needed for an exclusion. OK, now something that everybody asks is, aren't there all kinds of little two sigma anomalies going on right now at, at, at the LHC? Aren't there all sorts of little hints? And of course, anything which is a little hint sitting there, two, two and a half, three sigma, if these hints are sitting there, then these things are poised to very rapidly turn into five sigma, right? Um, and in fact, there's. I mean, if you count all of them, there are maybe six or seven, uh, all told, all possible anomalies. They're almost all completely unbelievable. Um, uh, and in fact, uh, some, some experimentalists did a nice study to do a statistical study of the number of two sigma to three sigma excesses that have been reported by the experimentalists. Okay? The number of such discrepancies reported by the experimentalists is smaller than you'd expect statistically. And it's a four sigma effect, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and so uh, there's probably a theory for it. <laughs> As theorists, we can probably come up with a theory. The theory is that experimentalists don't release their <laughs> two, three sigma excesses. They, they, they keep them close to their chest, probably for decent reasons. Um, and there's other possible explanations for it. Anyway, we, we can talk about it later. So, so uh, there, there's probably more of these anomalies than meet the eye. The experimentalists probably know, about, know more about them than we do. 
But once again, just for the sake of the argument, I just want to give you an example of some anomaly to watch. This is something that we'll all be watching. I mean, I don't believe it for a second, but it's something that we'll be watching um, because it's something which Atlas sees, CMS sees. If you put on extraordinarily fuzzy goggles, it looks roughly the same between Atlas and CMS, and it's around two and a half sigma for both Atlas and CMS. Um, you have to put on very fuzzy goggles, okay? Because if you look at it in any more detail, the, the, the two seem to exclude each other. Anyway, that'll be a, I don't want to talk about it in too much detail, but just, just so you see, here's an example. Oh, look, this looks wonderful. There's something that's, uh, uh, that's, uh, that's a pretty big bump um, um, it, uh, with, a, uh, with a WW final state where the Ws are decaying uh, hadronically. Okay? Um, so the, the underlying model could be uh, there's something that couples the quarks to gluons, uh, about 2 TeV resonance that decays to a WW. Okay, so that's sitting there at around two and a half sigma in Atlas, and something similar sitting at around the same mass, not really the same mass, you know, but there is a similar bump in a CMS. And we spent, a, many of us have spent a long time looking at these things, getting more or less excited about them. Um, but uh, in any case, this is an example of something. If this is real, by August we'll know. Okay? So it's already two and a half sigma upwards for both CMS and Atlas. If it's real, we'll, we'll know by, by the end of the summer. Now, um, just uh, as a little rule of thumb, there's something I learned from uh, uh, one of my long ago students, uh, uh, Natalia Toro, that I call the Toro test, uh, which is when you should get excited by bumps in an experimental plot. If you're getting excited by bumps in an experimental plot, turn the plot upside down and see if you're still excited by some other bump. Okay? <laughs> if you are, you shouldn't be so excited about the one that you're excited to begin with. So, so the atlas definitely passes the Toro plot. Well, not so much for that one. Okay? <laughs> Um, so anyway, that, uh, I don't take this very, very seriously. But in any case, there, there may be more things like this in the experimentalist snow, so it's possible that things will just come out of the blue um, uh, already very, very rapidly, and, and, and we'll know about them. OK, so um, that's all I want to say about that. Now I want to spend a few minutes talking about some slightly more uh, theoretical things, and um, at least sort of my own personal take on uh, what might be going on at the TV scale. After all this time thinking about it, I think there's, we don't have very much to go on. We have lots of contradictory evidence and hints and suggestions for what, what, what might be going on. But uh, there's, a, there's a picture that I, I've liked for a very long time, and I just want to quickly talk about it. It will partially also give a nice segue into the next topic that I want to talk about. So important question. Should we be worried or depressed right now uh, by the fact that we didn't discover supersymmetry in run one? So this is a, an, an obvious question, or any other natural physics, but we all like supersymmetry the best. And uh, I have to say, I've found that the, the reaction to the absence of supersymmetry in run one, not by string theorists, actually, really by many of my phenomenological colleagues, to be very puzzling. Because uh, at least my own attitude about it uh, for a while has been that I'm not much more worried about it than I was before run one. That's because I was already a little worried about it. And there's already reason to be a little worried, maybe not tremendously worried, but there's reason to be a little worried about it, um, uh, given the fact that supersymmetry wasn't discovered at LEP2 already. See, it's not like everyone was totally convinced it's obviously true that low energy supersymmetry was dead right, uh, and that it was only run one that poured cold water on all of our hopes and dreams. It was many phenomenologists looking at what we were learning uh, even before the LHC, uh, thought that we should have seen supersymmetry earlier. Okay? And um, in fact, th there's a very zeroth order point, which is that if you imagine there's all sorts of new physics at the TeV scale, um, as you might expect there to be if you're solving the uh, uh, hierarchy problem with lots of uh, ex extra new states around, then there's no reason why the standard model explanation for the approximate symmetries, baryon number, lepton number, flavor, and CP, and so on, the standard model provides a beautiful explanation for all of these for the small size of all these processes as approximate symmetries, but that explanation is ruined if you have all sorts of new physics at the TeV scale. And the scales that are suggested instead for where the new particles should be are much higher than a TeV. Where's the barren lepton number all the way up to the gut scale, but with flavor and CP even, it's 100, 1,000, 10,000 TeV even. Okay? So of course, people have known about this since 1979. Okay? Uh, but the attitude towards it for a long time was this was not a problem, it's an opportunity. It's telling us that the physics of the TV scale isn't totally random. 
it has some structure which, uh, which uh, preserves these approximate symmetries that we know about. This attitude could still be correct. It could still be correct, basically correct. But it's already a very early reason, sort of structural reason, why there was some tension uh, between the desire to solve the hierarchy problem and other things we already knew about much lower energy particle physics. And this tension has just been exacerbated as time has gone on. Okay? So uh, the, 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 the biggest issue uh, with the low energy supersymmetry, if we ignore all these uh, uh, issues with the approximate symmetries, is not why it wasn't discovered at run one, but why it wasn't discovered at lap. Because you know, this is a theory for the electroweak scale, for W and Z masses. The, the W and Z masses are 80 and 90 GeV. They're not 1 TeV. Okay? And in fact, uh, um, most uh, people who studied the phenomenology of supersymmetry uh, since the 1980s had a sort of spectrum like this in mind. Um, typically, squarks, colored particles get heavier than uncolored particles. But the Higgs, because it has a large coupling to the top quark, gets dragged up to where the squarks are. So what sets the mass of the Higgs and ultimately the mass of the Z is more tied to the masses of the squarks and the gluinos. So there was a relatively reasonable picture where you imagined that the Z was actually close to the top of the spectrum. Uh, and maybe there are particles lighter than it. The subtons could be lighter than it. The, 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 the models and, and phenomenological papers in the 80s and, er, uh, and, and, and early 90s were filled with models with uh, you know, sleptons at 60 GeV. Why not? It's a theory for the weak scale. Um, and w in, ignoring any detailed issues about measures of fine tuning and so on and so forth, the, the real issue is that we've seen, instead of this kind of reasonable spectrum, what the, what's the natural spectrum to a theorist, the, the real natural spectrum from nature, the nature old spectrum, uh, puts the Z and the Higgs at the bottom, and we haven't seen anyone else uh, yet. Okay, so that's the more structural difficulty. Okay? The, the, the difference between theorist natural and natural. Um, and that was already a problem in 1999, 1998. Okay? Now, in the MSSM, literally the MSSM, there's a milder cousin of this problem uh, associated with the fact that the Higgs weighs 125 GeV. Okay? Uh, the Higgs mass is tied by supersymmetry to the mass of the Z, and uh, it's only supersymmetry breaking effects that can uh, allow the quartic coupling to become bigger than the gauge coupling given by the D terms. However, that's a logarithmic running effect. Uh, as you make the stops heavier and heavier, the Higgs quartic becomes larger and larger logarithmically, but you pay quadratically in the fine tuning uh, as you make the stop heavier and heavier. So that's why it hurts. Every three GeV that you have to make the Higgs heavier than the Z hurts uh, as far as uh, uh, fine tuning goes. And roughly speaking, with the Higgs mass at 125 GeV, this alone is about a 1% tuning uh, in, the, in, in the MSSM. Now, there's lots of, lots of ways around this. Uh, there are many ways of getting corrections to the, uh, to the quartic couplings um, uh, from other supersymmetry breaking effects that can make it larger. And small extensions of the MSSM with additional scalars, additional gauge groups. <clears throat> and uh, just, just to uh, put this in a little bit of context, many of the people who are very worried and are, and are uh, you know, pulling out their hair about uh, supersymmetry now, Many of these same people were very happy to write papers in 1999 and 2000, where they had the stops at one TeV, the Higgsino mu term at one TeV. You go to plots, you look at all these things without even thinking twice about it. They would have these very high numbers. And when you know, some of us would say, isn't that pretty fine tuned? They said, oh, who cares? You know, compared to the Planck scale, it's nothing. But, uh, and it's true. <laughs> compared to the Planck scale, it is nothing. There might be these little accidents. You know, percentage accidents happen. There are little percentage accidents all over the place in other parts of the, uh, of the, uh, of the couplings that we've seen in the standard model. Um, but the story is that already, even before the LHC, just getting the Higgs up to the 115 GeV limit from, from LAP was forcing us into uncomfortable territory. Okay? Uh, you could summarize what, going, what, what finding the Higgs at 125 did uh, in the following slogan, that beforehand, when we just had to get the, up to 115, we had to either imagine that the stops were heavier than we wanted, they were maybe at one TeV, or we had to imagine some extra dipsy doodle, that we had some extra scalars, extra U1s, and so on. And now that it's at 125, we have to imagine the stops are heavy and that there's a dipsy doodle. Okay? But 
that's not a humongous deal, right? It, you, you're already in this territory. Uh, um, you were thinking along these lines uh, already before. And so that's why I said, you know, there are people who are already somewhat mildly worried, and we're a little bit more uh, mildly worried, but it's not, it's not a humongous deal. <clears throat> of course, no matter what's going on, purely from the bottom up, you can make an argument for where we have to see, uh, purely from the bottom up, you can make an argument for where we have to see the stops, where we have to see the gluino, uh, in order to just not have any fine tuning at all. Right? So let's forget about uh, arguing whether this amount of tuning is good, bad. If, if it's going to be completely natural, then you just draw the low energy diagram for the, uh, with the top loop for the Higgs. You ask, what should cut that off? The stop should cut that off. And in the best possible case, there's no logarithmic enhancements, uh, and you get a mass of around 400 GeV for the stops. And in turn, for the stops to be at 400, you can ask, how is it OK for them to be that light and not have color? Uh, make them heavier, and that tells you how heavy the gluinos have to be. That's ultimately a two-loop correction to the Higgs mass, and that tells you the gluinos got to be lighter than around 1,300 GeV. Okay? So, and if you don't see this, now we're in tuning territory. We can talk about whether it's good or bad too much. Uh, a big deal, not a big deal, but we have these unavoidable tunings that we are, uh, that we are talking about. And it's definitely true that if we take the most vanilla pictures for uh, how the stop is produced and decayed at the LHC so far, we're in that tuning territory right now. Because okay? uh, you saw the limits on the stop are 600, 700. Um, although, again, it, it could also be at 200 if it decays in a more complicated way. OK. All right, so um, given time, I'll, I'll go through this quickly. So, <clears throat> so this is the, um, this is the, uh, the a picture that, that, uh, that, that, that I've liked for a long time. Um, that, um, so, uh, we have all these indications that supersymmetry is on the right track. It solves the hierarchy problem in a big way. We have gauge coupling unification with this beautiful picture for dark matter. On the other hand, we have these tensions. We haven't seen the flavor changing neutral current CP violation. We haven't seen the superpartners yet. So what could explain all of these facts uh, at the same time? And this is a simple picture that could explain these facts at the same time, that simply the scalars are heavier than the gauge genos. And the scalars can be heavier than the gauge genos because the gauge genos and, and perhaps the Higgs genos uh, can be protected by an R symmetry. The second you push the scalars to be 100 or 1,000 TeV, more like 1,000 TeV or heavier, then immediately you lose all of these difficulties with flavor change and neutral currents, all sorts of other cosmological problems. Um, you can preserve the supersymmetric picture for dark matter because the lightest fermions will be at around the TeV. That's why they have to be at around the TeV scale. Now, not because of naturalness, but in order to give dark matter. Um, and of course, the theory is fine-tuned now, <laughs> no doubt about it. It's fine-tuned. It may be a part in 10,000, a part in 100,000, a part in a million, depending on where the scalars are. And we can talk about all sorts of stories for why it's good or bad or okay or not okay for it to be tuned, but I'll remind all of us that all of these supersymmetric theories were already at least 10 to the 60 or more tuned for the cosmological constant. So, so this is not, uh, you know, we're not on some high horse of no tuning in all of these theories. The only picture we have for, for where they, uh, uh, for getting much more basic things than the spectrum right. The fact there's this big universe, flat universe out there, uh, already involves a humongous amount of tuning that this completely pales uh, relative to. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so the concrete successes are still there. You, uh, dark matter is there. Gauge coupling unification works just as in the supersymmetric theory. Um, uh, in fact, it's slightly better. I'll, sh I'll show you a plot in a second. And this is just a quick theoretical point that uh, a one-loop splitting between the gauge genos and the scalars is very simple and sort of ubiquitous, easy to get in lots of uh, ultraviolet theories of supersymmetry breaking. I think this kind of spectrum is what really simple, dumb theories of SUSY breaking want to do, simply because it's easy to break SUSY and a little bit harder to break R <laughs> after you break SUSY. Okay, so this is a simple kind of spectrum. Lots of people ran into it in building supersymmetric uh, models of supersymmetry breaking. They threw the spectrum out because it wasn't natural. But we can take this uh, different attitude if there's something else dealing with these uh, tuning problems, even without saying the A word or talking about the multiverse or the landscape. If there's something else which is uh, taking care of them, then maybe we should just let supersymmetry breaking models do what they want to do and see what happens. Okay. And <clears throat> um, one thing that happens is that the Higgs at 125 GeV is totally fine. Okay. Um, in fact, this picture with this one loop splitting, the scalars between 100 to 1,000 TeV, predicted that the Higgs should be between 120 and 135 GeV. 
And so 125 is perfectly fine. So you can have scalars up at around 100 or 1,000 TeV and have the Higgs uh, uh, at 125 with the, with the uh, tan beta at 2 or 4, some reasonable order 1 number. Uh, you could imagine that the stops are much lighter. They're at 10 TeV uh, if tan beta is big. Okay? But if there's no big or small numbers, you're not doing anything, well, it's happy with stops at 100 or 1,000 TeV. Okay, and gauge coupling unification, as I said, works just as in the supersymmetric theory. In fact, in detail, it's slightly better. Um, if anyone followed uh, the story of supersymmetric gauge coupling unification, uh, you knew that at zeroth order, it's wonderful. But when you look at two-loop corrections, um, you find that things are a little bit off. And the usual response to this was to imagine that there was some splitting of states up near the gut scale with triplet Higgs nodes, maybe a factor of 100 lighter than the gut scale, which had uh, it's not the most wonderful thing, but anyway, it's uh, certainly possible. And so here, exactly the same thing is eff effectively accomplished by pushing the Higginos up around 100 times heavier than the weak scale. So uh, the prediction for alpha acid MZ, if the Higginos are around 100 TeV, is 115, okay, which is 118 is the, uh, is the current value, um, versus 128 in the normal supersymmetric picture. Anyway. So, um, so that's, uh, that's, that's a picture some of us have, have liked for a while. But I go through it just in order to illustrate it's possible that these old successes were not accidents. Um, it's possible that, they're, that, uh, um, that there's a slightly different uh, picture of low energy supersymmetry at work. But once naturalness is not the motivation anymore, we're not guaranteed to see the particles at, at the LHC. We could see them, but we're not guaranteed to see them at the LHC. So for example, we can pair produce gluinos. They can decay in this wonderful way to a TT bar plus a Higgs plus missing energy. Very spectacular final states, eight Bs, four Ws, all sorts of uh, very, very hard to miss. Um, uh, if the scales are heavy enough, the gluino decays could even be slightly displaced. They're, they can be long lived. But um, we might have a picture where the dark matter is a simple thermal relic made out of these winos or binos. And it could be down at one TeV or two, two or three TeV. That's the bottom of the spectrum. The top of the spectrum, the gluinos could be at 10, 15 TeV. Okay? Then forget it. We're not going to see that at the LHC. I should say that we can't imagine that we push everything 10 times heavier than that, because then the Higgs mass comes out to be too big. Okay, um, okay so that, that, that's LHC invisible. But of course, we could be lucky. The gluino could be lighter. The dark matter could be in more interesting linear combination of these states. And then it could be also LHC wonderful. So once we lose naturalness as the motivation, if it's just other direct physical things like dark matter, then, you know, then, then the LHC is not the dark matter machine. Okay? The, the, the LHC was a very good naturalness machine. It's not the dark matter machine, necessarily. It could be, but it's not, uh, it's not necessarily the WIMP machine. OK, so I'm halfway through my talk. Uh, so, um, so, um, so I think what I will do is, um, uh, how long do I have, actually, Kara? Two minutes. OK, very good. That's very interesting. So, uh, OK, so um, um, all right. That, then, then I think uh, what, 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 what I wanted to do was uh, spend a little, a little bit of time telling you about um, uh, motivations, physics motivations for going beyond the LHC. Uh, as you all know, thinking about and planning for these next big machines is a two or three decade long process. And if we're going to have something after the LHC, um, uh, we have to start thinking about it now and start planning for it now. Um, and uh, so I'm not going to have time to uh, tell you all the physics uh, motivations. Um, but uh, I should say that, of course, there's already discussion about building a big linear collider in Japan, which would be absolutely wonderful. Um, but in order to get, eventually get to the energy frontier, we'd like to have a circular collider. And so there's lots of discussion both in Europe uh, and also in China, about the possibility to build great big circular colliders around 100 kilometers around, um, and to first uh, run it in a mode where you collide electrons and positrons to produce millions of Higgs particles and study the properties of the Higgs in great detail, um, and um, then to uh, move on to 100, ultimately around 100 TV proton-proton uh, uh, collisions and get us to the energy frontier. And perhaps I don't have any time to talk about the, the detailed uh, case, but, uh, but maybe uh, I, will, I, I will say this much. Um, the main physics motivation behind these machines 
Uh, we don't know what there's, of course, biggest motivation is we don't know what's at the frontier. We want to go there and see what's going on. Um, but the more direct, concrete motivation um, is that we've seen something totally new. Uh, often people say that unless we see new physics at the LHC, we're screwed, you know, we're never going to build another machine, we'll never convince government, blah, blah, all sorts of stuff. Um, and it's a very sloppy argument. It's a very sloppy argument because it has a conflation in it, which is that new physics equals new particles. And new physics meant new particles 50 years ago. That was in the glory period of particle physics, that was true. But incredibly important things like the fact that there's no ether. Okay, this is a humongous fact, a very important fact, did not involve discovering a new particle. What we really care about isn't new particles. What we really care about is new phenomenon and, and new principles. And from this point of view, uh, the Higgs is already very new physics, because we've never seen an, an elementary particle like it. Um, uh, and it's very likely the harbinger of some profound new, new, new principles um, uh, um, that, that we probably don't, still don't understand, especially if we don't see the, the, the physics that we've been uh, expecting for a number of decades at the weak scale. So this is the main explicit motivation for these machines. It's to study the Higgs, very new thing. We've never seen an elementary spin zero particle that looks point-like. Um, and it's to just study it, put it under a microscope and study it. So as I said, we've never seen a point-like scalar. What we're going to get from the LHC is a sort of 10% magnification picture of the LHC. Okay? So that means that we'll measure the couplings of the Higgs to other particles like Zs and other, to around the 10% level. That's sort of literally like putting it under a microscope, not a photon microscope, for example, but a Z microscope, um, bouncing Zs off of it, or looking at how it decays to Zs, with 10 times magnification. That's good. If it looks point-like at that level, it already shows that it's not some big fat composite state. But you know, pions are roughly that big. Okay? So it's not terribly different than, uh, than, than pions. And pions aren't the harbinger of some dramatic change in the way we, uh, we, uh, we uh, think about things. Um, so we'd like, to, we'd like to do it better. And that's what you need the precision E plus E minus collider for. The precision E, e plus E minus collider will take these 10% coupling measurements and take them almost to the 0.1% level. Okay? So between sub-percent level. Okay? So a factor of 10 or more higher. And, and that's a real thing. You know, experimentalists will be able to say, look, we see that the Higgs looks point-like. It really looks uh, point-like in a way that we've never, we've never seen before. So that's the motivation for the Higgs factory. And there's something else which is really unique about the Higgs. No other elementary particle can interact with itself. Of course, you say gluon self-interact, graviton self-interact. But in more detail, you're always changing some quantum number. You're changing the color quantum number. You're changing helicities. Okay? Um, we've never seen the most basic possible process in quantum field theory, which is the self-interaction of a single cubic interaction of a single uh, state. It's uniquely only possible for a spinless, chargeless uh, particle and so this triple Higgs coupling uh, tells you that not only does the Higgs look point-like to other things, it looks point-like to itself. Okay? And the LHC won't even be able to tell us if this coupling is there or not. Okay? So these are things that you know, we don't have to wait. We already know that uh, the LHC isn't going to give us an answer to the question of how point-like the Higgs looks. We already know it's not going to tell us if it couples to itself. But a 100 TV collider will make a billion Higgses, and will make these, uh, uh, well, this well, th these processes will happen at sufficiently high rates that people are debating what the accuracy is, but the, the accuracy that they're talking about are on the 10%, 5% level for measurement of that uh, triple Higgs coupling. So there might be all sorts of other things, supersymmetry, this, that, the other, uh, but those are other general frontier things, but these facts about the Higgs are the direct motivation for both the, uh, 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 both the Higgs factory and ultimately the 100 TV collider. All right. So that's all I'll say about it. Doom -de -doom -de -doom. Um, uh, oh, but OK, I can't. Uh, so uh, I'll do this and, and end. Of course, what's extremely exciting is that um, there, are, there are people with some uh, uh, vision and, um, and ambition around the world who are talking about doing this seriously. And what makes a particle physicist happier than anything is a picture of a map of some region of the world with big circles on it. Okay? <laughs> so. Uh, so here's the area around uh, Geneva. There's the LHC. And this is the ring that they're talking about, 80 to 100 kilometers, go under Lake Geneva. Um, and uh, and uh, at CERN, this project it goes under the name of the FCC for Future Circular Collider. 
there's lots of important and great efforts that are underway to study that. And same kind of maps exist in China. So this is a, an area around 300 kilometers northeast of uh, Beijing. Um, uh, I'm told that it's very beautiful. The Communist Party officials go there uh, for their summer vacations um, as rolling hills. It's very lovely. And there are these rings on the ground, a 50 kilometer ring, 100 kilometer ring. Um, and um, and it's, being, uh, it's being seriously talked about. Uh, a, a large group of people spent uh, a good part of last year putting together uh, what's called a pre-conceptual design report for this machine in China. If you're interested, you could go uh, to the uh, website of the Institute for High Energy Physics in China, where the, the, both the sort of physics case as well as the accelerator and detector part of this conceptual design report is uh, publicly available. Um, and uh, the proposal has been made to the Chinese government, and they're thinking about it seriously th this year, so this summer. Uh, and the thought is that by the end of the year, um, we'll have some preliminary indication of whether they're going to go for a five-year phase around $200 million um, study of uh, R&D for the possibility of having these, uh, of, uh, of, of having these uh, machines. So, um, so I think this is, this, is, uh, this is very exciting, and we should, we should hope and, um, and try to help uh, make it happen uh, as much as possible. We've been getting lots of fantastic help from people like David, and Yao and other people um, to uh, uh, push these things, especially in uh, China. But I think, especially if there's some indication that they're, they're, they're going to move forward, I think um, uh, engagement with more and more of the, of the theory community will, will, will be important. All right, so that's it. Um, let me just say, repeat, that the next uh, one to three years uh, are going to maximize by far the discovery potential of the LHC. So if there's ever a time to pay attention to the LHC, this is it. Um, it's, of course, crucial to seriously push for the next generation of collider experiments. And something else which is very important to do, I didn't spend any time uh, talking about, but, but, uh, but there's lots of very interesting activities uh, that theorists are engaged in along these lines, is to think of new kinds of smaller scale experiments that can probe fundamental physics. Um, so, you know, the, the, it's, uh, we're, we're, we're talking about a, a decade or two um, between the LHC and whatever the next things are, and this shouldn't be an empty period. It should be filled with exciting uh, things. Experimentalists want to think about, theorists can help them uh, come up with uh, interesting things to do. And um, I just want to end with the following general, uh, more theoretical comment. I think it's kind of striking that essentially nothing about the naturalness problem, um, the naturalist puzzles has worked out in the way theorists expected in the 80s and the 90s. Okay. The cosmological constant didn't work out the way theorists expected. It wasn't zero for some magic mystery reason. And the hierarchy problem, which seemed like a much smaller scale concrete problem in particle physics, so on. Now, maybe by the end of the year, we'll see it's supersymmetry, it's a little tuned, but no big deal. And then it'll basically be the way people expect it, maybe a little bit funnier. Or we might learn something more dramatic. We might not even see, we might not see that. We might see stranger versions like Split Susie or other things that we haven't thought about yet. Um, but it's not the picture people, it's not the picture people were talking about 20 years ago. Okay? And I think this is, there's something important about this. I think uh, nature may be giving us some powerful clues um, uh, about physics. And uh, what I want to stress is that at least I think these clues are not necessarily disconnected from many of the other things that, uh, that, that string theorists like to uh, think about a lot. For example, uh, the, the question of the emergence of space-time. Um, uh, this is not disconnected from the cosmological constant problem. After all, something that we mercilessly make fun of other dumber approaches to quantum gravity for is that they never get flat space. They get these huge fluctuations, terrible things, never get flat space. Now, in a supersymmetric theory, we can get flat space. Fantastic. We can get flat space. We can talk about quantum gravity and flat space. It's wonderful. It's great. But in a non-supersymmetric theory, it's curled up at the Planck scale uh, uh, with positive or negative cosmological constant. That's not much better than what they get. Okay. So uh, I think there's something sort of important about that, potentially. Now, of course, um, there's a picture that uh, a lot of people are, some people hate, some people like more. I'm certainly amongst the people who like it more that say we have a quasi-explanation for these things. There's a big landscape. Uh, there's all sorts of places. Some places, accidentally, the cosmological constant is small. Maybe the Higgs mass is small. Uh, this is definitely po possible. And I think if we, we don't have a better explanation of the cosmological constant, 
Um, if we don't see any new physics at, at the weak scale at all, at the moment, we don't have a, we don't have a coherent explanation for all of these things uh, other than that. So uh, it's like what Churchill said about democracy, right? It's the worst form of government except for all the other ones. So, so this would be the, the, the worst possible explanation for all these tuning problems except for all the other ones, right? And I think even those of us who think there was something correct about this picture potentially, everyone agrees that, the, that it's uh, the, the, the level of um, uh, goodness of understanding that we get from it is vastly smaller than what we're used to in our field, right? So even if you believe in that picture, I, I think it's sort of very important to continue to try to think about how to make it more precise, how to make it make sense. And if it continues not to make sense, then maybe there are some completely different pictures as well. Um, now, of course, we can't just sit around complaining that we don't have uh, any better ideas. Uh, and if we don't have better ideas, it's, be it's better to do concrete things that are under our feet and explore all the wonderful structures that everyone here is exploring in one way or the other. But I think it might be worth keeping these problems closer to the front of our minds. And maybe I can say it in a much more pithy way. Uh, um, uh, Sidney Coleman, uh, I think, famously said that uh, every theorist should think about the cosmological constant problem 15 minutes a day before they fall asleep. Okay? <laughs> and uh, I, I think, well, I would agree with that. I think, uh, so I think it would be good. These are potentially very powerful clues from nature that we're getting from experiment. And, and it would be good to, uh, if not do something about them concretely, maybe the problems are too hard, to at least uh, keep them in the front of our minds a little more. Thank you very much. Uh, a couple of times you said the stop could be as light as 200 GV yeah. if it decays in a sufficiently weird yes, way. Yes. So what is this weird? Well, it, it, it could be so light that, uh, that it can't decay to a top. So then yeah. it could decay to charm, and then, then there's very little missing energy. It's just a hydronic mess. But how so hard would uh, that be to discover at the next, in the next three years? I, I, honestly, it's not so, uh, it's not, it's not so obvious uh, how well you can do with the LHC, even with such complicated scenarios. Um, but had I gotten to uh, actually talk about it, um, uh, part of the nice thing about having these E plus E minus machines is that completely independent of hadronic muck, mm -hmm. they can probe the stops up to a TeV. Totally independent of hadronic muck because they affect the couplings of the Higgs. Okay? But they, their entire point is to, is, to, is to talk to the Higgs, and so they change the couplings of the Higgs uh, to the Z. They change, even on the Z pole, they, they affect the so we go back to the z-pole and get a factor of 10,000 or 100,000 more z's than we got at LEP. And uh, so, yeah, so that's one nice thing about the plus and minus machines, that they just completely kill all of these uh, weird, weird possibilities in a very model-independent way. You mentioned, of course, all these exclusion plots we already have yeah. from the first run. Uh, but uh, I mean, usually people, when they put them together with the constraints from dark matter and so on, oh, the tension gets worse. Yeah. So no, no, what's but, that's, but that, that makes so many, so many theoretical assumptions about what's going on. I mean, I think that there, there, it makes so little sense to do that. Um, those sort of things, you know. Uh, uh, of course, many of us, many of us thought we're going to be in a period where we're swimming. You know, people used to talk about supersymmetry as the background to the discovery of the Higgs, right? And in a situation like that, where you have so much going on, then, then yeah, it makes sense to take some constrained model, see if it fits. But we're so far from that situation that it makes very little sense to talk about that. Thank you. You mentioned the three-point coupling of the Higgs and, in general, the interactions of the Higgs as really interesting things that we could um, learn about at the, at the next uh, collider. What are the, if we aren't lucky enough to see supersymmetry at the next run at the, at the LHC, yes, what, yes. Are, what are the interesting oh, things? Oh, yeah, so, so supersymmetry, you see that, so low energy supersymmetry cannot hide. So maybe I'll use this, thank you, Andy, you're a good no, friend. But, but wait, so but suppose uh, we that don't see it, what is the most, suppose we don't see it yes. at the next run, what is, what is the interesting things we should be looking for? Well, you see, the, 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 uh, you, you, we should always be looking for it. Uh, the, uh, even if we don't see it at all at the LHC, supersymmetry would be maybe a percent tuned. Okay? 
then we can talk for ages about whether it's good, bad. I can pull out 10 examples, okay, not 10, but two or three examples of other things where accidents like that happen. Uh, compared to the huge hierarchy problem, it's nothing. So we could just be unlucky and miss it. But, um, but, uh, uh, but if we go to 100 TV, we don't see any, any super partners. Now we're talking about a part in 10,000. Uh, it's, it's different, it's 100 times worse. So, so, but if we're, if we're unlucky, if super semi is really around the corner, we can see super partners up to 10, 20 TeV at the 100 TeV collider. So it's, uh, we, 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 there's but, roughly you know, My a question was, suppose yeah. we just don't want to think about supersymmetry. Right. What, what, what are the interesting things that we might see, that we might learn from, from the next run at the LHC? Oh, sorry, from the next run at the LHC. Yeah. Sorry, I'm sorry. Um, oh, well, so uh, supersymmetry, first of all, is just one stand-in, uh, just the most concrete stand-in for every possible uh, natural theory. So it might not be supersymmetry. It might be a composite. The Higgs might be composite. It's slightly, theoretically, a little bit more boring, but it's something we've seen before. Pions exist. They're a little, they're more point, they're not a big fat object. They're, they're, uh, um, uh, they're a little bit elementary. Um, and um, so, um, yeah, so it could be a composite Higgs. And so you could, you could look for that. You could look for resonances that, uh, that, that, that couple to the Higgs. Up to, as you, as you saw, the resonance reaches up to maybe 3, 4 TeV. Uh, you, you could look for uh, analogs of the superpartner of the top. In composite Higgs models, uh, these would be partners of the top that are fermionic, not bosonic. And the reach for them is very similar for this top. So perhaps I, I should have said that. Whenever we talk about supersymmetry, it's always a stand-in for essentially every possible standard natural picture for what could be going on. Because in every such picture, there's a partner for the standard model particles, um, sometimes with the same spin, opposite spin. But the reaches are all uh, roughly the same. You could look for additional Higgses. Forget about naturalists, but you know, something that would really convince, certainly convince me that none of the ways that we've been thinking about the naturalist idea are right is that we see three extra Higgses. Nothing else, just a bunch of extra scalars, right? And nothing works. The anthropic arguments don't work. Nothing works. It, it, it just tells you that we're just thinking about something completely wrong, okay? Uh, so the reach for extra Higgses goes up to maybe, depending on how they couple, 700 GV, 800 GV. So there is a whole panoply of things that, that we could, should, and are, are looking for. You can take all those things, and if you go to the next generation machine, you can multiply it all roughly by a factor of five, five and a half, and uh, in some cases, much better. Um, um, and uh, yeah. Okay, I think we thank Nima again.